Good morning, my name is uh, Steve Call. I'm the president of the New America Foundation. It's my pleasure to welcome you here to the second Bernard Schwartz Economic Symposium of 2009 that uh, New America is organizing. I won't uh, take too much of your time, but I want to start with just a few uh, housekeeping items and uh, sort of orientation. We're going to be, uh, one of my colleagues just said, the way New America does these kinds of conferences, it's like a nonstop flight. We uh, don't believe in breaks, we believe in flow. Uh, the seatbelt sign is off, if you need to go to the bathroom, just uh, get yourself up and go, go to the back. Uh, but we will run straight through three panels, uh, so you're on your own uh, taking care of yourself. Um, the uh, event is live and on the record. It's being web streamed to audiences around town and around the country. Please be aware of that when you fashion your remarks, and also be aware of it when uh, as we will do with each of the three panels, we turn to you for your questions and uh, participation. Please do be patient, wait for the microphone to arrive, and please uh, have the courtesy of, to introduce yourself to, to the audience before you speak. Now would be a good time to check your cell phones and buzzers and pagers and beepers and make sure they're all uh, quiet. Um, I do want to just take a minute to set today's event into a context, because as I say, it's the second of three uh, symposia that uh, our board member and colleague Bernard Schwartz has made possible at New America. First, I'd like to thank you, Bernard, for your support and intellectual leadership in putting this together this year. But I'd also like to explain where uh, this partnership started and where we are now, because we're, we're moving deliberately through a body of work that I think uh, is, is designed in a way that, that we'd like you to help uh, sort of fashion as well. I came to uh, New America about two years ago, and the first of these I attended was in this room in December of 2007. And the subject of that conference meeting was the, uh, the rising asset bubble in housing prices. Uh, it was, it was a, a morning structured in a similar way, several panels, uh, very rigorous, uh, research-based presentations and argumentation about how far along this evident bubble in housing prices had come and what it portended for economic performance over the next five years. And I, as a, like a lot of you, I think, in the audience, am a non-economist who's uh, sort of semi-literate in the profession, proficient but not fluent, and I, I listened with great attention that day and came home uh, to my house at the end of, of the day, and this new job, my wife said, how was your day? I said, fine, except I think the world that we've known for the last 20 years is apparently coming to an end. And it was, in fact, a, not an exercise in forecasting, but an exercise in deep, rigorous analysis of the structure of the economy with an eye on a five-year horizon. And I think as a non-economist, we all recognize, listening to economists argue with one another, that the reason this is both a science and a dismal science is that sometimes it sounds uh, and is convincing as uh, statistics that are as reliable as, say, molecular physics. And in the very next sentence, uh, it can sound as unreliable as pop sociology. And the difficulty, if you're sitting in the audience, is to distinguish between those two features. And uh, what was so impressive about this conference in 2007 was that the deep structural analysis of the asset bubble was simply irrefutable, was mathematically irrefutable. And I think that has shaped, uh, in partnership with Bernard and, and Cheryl Swenninger and the Economic Growth Program, our ambition for this year's series. So if you fast forward to the beginning of 2009, in the aftermath of last autumn's multiple interlocking crises and their, and their meaning, uh, we decided to try to build a body of work this year that would have those same characteristics, that would uh, try to look at deep structural issues in the economy with a five-year horizon in mind, to get past the quarterly cycle of earnings and GDP reports and the political discourse that follows that quarterly cycle, to look at the, uh, to look at the icebergs that had surfaced in the fall of last year and to try to think forward about them. And so we constructed three symposia this year, which, as I say, this is the second. The first occurred in the, in the late spring, and it was organized around the question, who will replace uh, the American consumer as an engine of uh, demand and economic growth in the United States and globally? And uh, if, you, if you attended, you know that after three and a half very enriching hours, 
uh, the essential answer was nobody. Uh, and, and I think Martin Wolf kind of offered that the night before uh, the first uh, meeting, and it was never really uh, refuted. Today, uh, we look at another structural uh, issue that is both present in political discourse and in many ways, we think, neglected and misunderstood because of the heavy emphasis on the public debt overhang. As you'll hear today, a lot of the theme that we want to bring forward today in both the research and the discourse is to add to that uh, debate a, a clearer understanding of the overhang of private uh, debt uh, in this country and, it, and the role that it's going to play in the uh, economic narrative ahead. And then the third of these three symposia that uh, are at the heart of our body of work this year in economic uh, policy is uh, to be held next month. I wish I had an exact date, but I think it'll be in sort of late October. And we're going to uh, focus then on the issue of jobs. Uh, because at the end of the day, uh, there is really no path forward or no issue more central uh, to the United States than where, as Bernard put it last night, the six or seven million jobs that this country requires to jumpstart uh, a, a sustainable recovery uh, are going to come from. And I think the purpose of this third body of work uh, will, be, will be focused on that question. I just want to... Uh, finish my introduction by, first of all, calling your attention to continuing resources that we'd like to make available to you. One of the things we've done today, as we did last time, is to leave you uh, a digestible a set of uh, charts and statistics, a product of very uh, hard work and analysis that Sheryl's group has been doing. We try to both uh, deliver rigor and also accessibility in political English, and, and uh, I think this package will find uh, very valuable and in some ways startling uh, in that respect. <laughs> Beyond this set of tools, there are many other papers and resources, analytical resources, available on the primary website that drives our economic policy work. It's called the New American Contract. Uh, it's at New America Contract, New American the Contract dot net. Uh, easy enough to find, I think. And then let me just finish by uh, sharing with you so that as you participate from the audience, you can sort of bear this in mind. There are, as we built this approach to economic policy work over this year, I think we've had several qualities in mind uh, as, as at least rooted in our ambition uh, for the kind of focus, because you have to make choices in this sort of policy work that we've, that we've emphasized. One is that we've tried to concentrate on household experience. Uh, in the end, uh, this last bubble and its bursting was uh, rooted in American households, and ultimately a sustainable recovery is going to have to occur there. So in choosing macroeconomic frameworks and analysis, we have tried to uh, keep that frame in the center. Secondly, as I said earlier, we're trying to think beyond these next couple of quarters where inventory cycles and the stimulus and other factors are clearly uh, creating a sense of at least short-term momentum to ask questions three to five years out about how sustainable this recovery is going to be and what are the structural impediments to a sustainable recovery. And finally, I think, and this is where I want to leave it and turn it over to our moderator, uh, we really value unconventional thinking at New America. And I think one of the reasons why we got into this crisis in the first place in our political economy, and one of the obstacles to a sustainable recovery, is the extent to which our political culture insists on narrow boundaries for permissible ideas and permissible analysis. We don't come at this from an ideological perspective. We come at it from the perspective of American interests and from the, and the perspective of, of the experiences of American households, especially those uh, in the bottom four quartiles of our, of our economy. But we uh, do value uh, the impermissible and unconventional idea, and you'll hear some of those today. I hope that, that you'll participate in that spirit. We're trying to make ourselves useful in this town by asking questions that are not politically possible for others to ask and by putting forward ideas that are uh, not always safe. So I hope that in that spirit we'll have a lively uh, morning. And I'm going to turn it over now to our uh, Master of Ceremonies, Steve Clemens. And thank you all very much for being here.
Thank you so much, Steve. Um, a couple of other items. We have a lot of folks watching online on various blogs on the New America Foundation website, and the various PowerPoints and graphs that Steve Call just mentioned will be uploaded uh, later today. We regret that they're not up there yet, but I've been told by, by Charles Schwenninger's team uh, that they'll be there. Um, I have the pleasure of moderating uh, the first panel. Uh, my colleague, uh, Michael Lind, will moderate the second panel, and Cheryl Schwenninger will, will moderate the third. So we'll have a bit of a, a, a door here. I'm going to encourage uh, the first panel to make its way up here while I uh, entertain for a few moments. So, so Cheryl Schwenninger, Carmen Reinhardt, Thomas Pally, and J James Galbraith. Uh, just come on up and join us. Greetings, Carmen. We didn't get to meet yet, but good to see you. Um, I should also say there are a lot of journalists here, and while this is uh, on the on the record and of course streaming online, and I've got to make um, uh, one uh, comment for those watching streaming. We had this wonderful club uh, as the uh, guest of, of one of my colleagues, Peter Bergen. But one of the rules of this club is you can be here, you can use it, you just can't mention the name of the club. Uh, so uh, if you are in fact writing about today's forum, it was a forum by the New America Foundation uh, in Washington, D.C. at some undisclosed location. Um, <clears throat> so other than that, uh, we're, we're all fine. Let me um, say a few words here very quickly uh, about, about the team that we're going to have. To my far right, uh, he really needs very little introduction, but Jamie Galbraith, James K. Galbraith, is the Lloyd M. Benson Chair in Government Business Relations and Professor of Government at, at UT Austin, a senior scholar at the Levy Economics Institute, Chair of the Board of uh, Economists for Peace and Security, columnist with Mother Jones. I'm on lots of listservs with Jamie Galbraith, and again, those are listservs we're not allowed to talk about, uh, but um, he is one of the most frequent posters. He's one of the most prolific thinkers and doers uh, in the field of economics, and it's a great pleasure to have Jamie with us today. Uh, to his left, we have Thomas Pally, who's a research associate with the Levy Economics Institute at Bard College, former chief economist with the U.S.-China Economic and Security Review Commission. Uh, I understand he's a Schwartz Fellow. I learned uh, uh, that as well with the New America Foundation. And a, very, very good to have Tom Pally, who is an author of one of the papers uh, in Cheryl's uh, series of work uh, for today's work. And we'll be making Tom Pally's paper available as well. And we have Carmen Reinhardt, Professor of Economics at the School of Public Policy in the Department of Economics. She's the author with Kenneth Rodoff, Rogoff of This Time is Different, Eight, Eight Centuries of Financial Folly. Um, I, I haven't seen this book yet, but I spent an afternoon with Ken uh, when this was nearing completion. And apparently, as I understand it from Ken Rogoff, it's a digest of every financial crisis in the entire world at all times. Is that, is that about right? In a nutshell. Yeah, in a nutshell, yes. <laughs> and he, you could tell he was right at the end of his book. But uh, research associate with the National Bureau of Economic Research, it's great to have you with us, Carmen. And then our colleague, as Steve Cole mentioned, Cheryl Schwenninger, who's director of the Economic Growth Program and co-director of the Smart Globalization Initiative at New America, uh, co-founder of our, our organization, a co-author with Bernard Schwartz of an economic recovery program for the post-bubble economy, uh, founding editor of the World Policy Journal. So let me start with uh, Cheryl Schwenninger to help set the stage today, take a few minutes to set the stage on the subject of how serious is the debt overhang, what does it mean, and can we grow our way out of it? Cheryl Schwenninger. Thank you, Steve. What I want to do in setting the, the scene for the rest of the panelists is essentially make four, five points. And I'll refer from time to time to the uh, PowerPoint handout to some of the charts that I'm mentioning. The first point is essentially that with bubbles comes excessive credit creation and more debt. And when the bubbles therefore collapse or deflate, we're left with a huge debt hangover or overhang of debt. And this has been especially true in the case of the current uh, deflation bursting of the housing and credit bubble because housing was such a widespread property of, of the American household. So as a result of the bursting of the credit bubble and the debt creation prior to that, the total US debt, as you see on, on, on page two, is now 373% of GDP, which is more than double what it was 25 years ago. The second point is that the biggest and most worrying Part of this <coughs> uh, uh, debt overhang is private sector debt. As you'll see from, 
from page three, household and financial sector debt growth accounted for most of the expansion of debt over the last uh, two decades. Household debt increased from 48% of GDP to 97% of GDP in 2009. And the financial sector debt, because of the increased use of leverage in the financial sector and the growth of the mortgage market, increased from approximately 19% in 1980 to 120% in 2009. <clears throat> by contrast, <clears throat> public sector debt, as measured by that held by the public, has actually only increased uh, modestly. It's now increasing rapidly, as you see. But, but in 2009, uh, the federal debt held by the public is uh, projected to increase to just 53% of GDP. So the great majority of the problem was in the private sector uh, debt. And that can also be seen by looking at, if you want to look at um, the, the slide 10, the government debt servicing burden today is actually less than it was for most of the last uh, three decades. At, at its peak in 1991, it was 3.28% of GDP, today it's only 1.75. So again, the, the gr much greater problem at the moment is the private sector debt hold, uh, hangover. The third point I want to make is that, as, as we point out in, in, in uh, page 14, is that a sustainable recovery, meaning a recovery that is driven primarily by private investment and consumption, is not possible until the private sector repairs its balance sheet more than it has been able to do so to date. Banks won't lend because they're in the process of rebuilding capital ratios and indeed the amount of capital they, they, uh, they own is still under erosion because of, of uh, questionable assets and because the government in fact may require them to hold more capital. And households are having to increase savings to pay down debt and that means that, that consumption uh, is constrained or is actually being cut because incomes are also falling during, during this period. The fourth point I want to make is that, <clears throat> that as, we, <clears throat> as we show on, on, uh, on, on page 20, uh, the private sector deleveraging has uh, barely begun and many more problems are ahead. Housing prices are notoriously slow to correct, and that means we're going to have a much longer period of correction ahead. And so banks still need to add capital. Households, in order to return to their uh, ratio of debt to disposable income, as we show on, on, on page 20, households need to pay down $4.35 trillion in debt to return to the 1990s level yet they face more downward pressures on houses because we're facing more mortgage resets. The foreclosure moratorium will be coming to an end in the next few mo months. Approximately one to four out of four mortgages is currently underwater, as we point out on, on page 23. That number is projected to increase to 48% by 2011. Even worse, as we point out on page 24, is that unemployment is rising, and housing and unemployment are intricately linked in this particular, uh, becoming intricately linked in this crisis. We're moving from a housing bubble crisis to what is now an unemployment housing crisis, where a lot of the foreclosures and, <clears throat> and falling behind on mortgage payments is related to cuts in hours of work or loss of job entirely. <clears throat> So the, the final point I want to make, and I think it will be expanded upon by, by, by Tom Powell and Jamie in particular, is that for an extended period of time, because this deleveraging process has barely begun, because so much debt has to be, balance sheet has to be repaired, you're going to have to see the government sector, a combination of the government sector, preferably public investment, and external demand 
make up for or offset the, the destimulative, depressing effects of private sector deleveraging for a period of time. I'm not sure our politics is ready for that, but that's where our analysis, or at least my economic analysis, leads us. Thank you very much, Cheryl. Carmen Reinhardt. Uh, good morning. It's uh, I want to thank the organizers for for inviting me here. And uh, um, as we heard in the opening remarks, uh, economics is known as the dismal science. And this morning, I'm going to be more dismal than science. Um, in case you weren't cheered up by the earlier remarks. Uh, so. Uh, I'm going to divide my brief remarks into two parts. Um, the first has to do a little bit with the outlook because you really cannot talk about the intermediate fiscal situation without saying something really fundamental about the outlook. Um, and I, I do have handouts and taking again a, an advertising opportunity, a lot of what you're about to hear, everything in, in effect that you're about to hear is coming from, from the book, This Time is Different, uh, which is meant to be ironic, um, um, with Ken Rogoff, and that is, is, is out imminently. Um, the issue of the outlook is fundamental because one of the features we do study uh, pre-war and post-war financial crises, and one of the key features of banking crises is they're protracted. That is, recovery is not immediate. And normally there is one very good reason for that, and we heard about that good reason, which is, is, is it involves the financial institutions restoration to health, which we do not have right now. There is a lot of, we recall when we discussed Japan in the 1990s, zombie loans. Well, we have a lot of zombie loans in our bank balance sheets right now. So one reason that makes the recovery protracted is the presence of unresolved debt overhangs in bank balance sheets. Um, the second reason why this particular crisis is also likely to be uh, more of a U-shaped pattern rather than a V-shaped pattern has to do with the important fact that it's a global crisis. A lot of the uh, analysis uh, that shows, for example, uh, the analysis that I've done with Ken that shows that in a typical post-war crisis, going from peak to trough in GDP takes about two years, so we would be right about on track, and then it takes another two years to get back to your pre-crisis income. So this is a so-called rule of four. Um, why that may be the upper or more optimistic bound is that this crisis is global. And we had not had, this is something we, we reiterate in our research and document, we had not had a truly global crisis since the Great Depression. And this is not for drama or overstating or anything, but the fact is the synchronicity of this crisis, banking crises in the US, in Europe, uh, severe economic downturns in almost every region, and a contraction in trade that we hadn't seen since 38 is global in nature. And that has important bearings for the recovery pattern. A lot of the engine of growth we, we heard about, is the consumer going to be the engine of growth? Uh, we, well, we doubt in the consumer where uh, recoveries from other severe financial crises. Sweden had a massive crisis in 91. Japan had a very protracted crisis, the lost decade, that began in 92. Emerging markets have known very severe uh, financial crises, but an important element of recovery was very rapid export growth. And that is because that particular country may have been in trouble, but the rest of the world wasn't. And the fact of the matter is that in varying degrees, right now the rest of the world is in trouble. And exports and imports, it doesn't matter which you look, trade in general, has not seen such a stark decline since 1938. 
uh, I'd have all the data if, 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 you, if you're interested in following that up. So let me turn to the handout very briefly. Uh, I want to emphasize, and in keeping with my upbeat tone, uh, the uh, four deadly Ds. Um, and the four Okay. The four deadly Ds are basically economic downturns, which we know now uh, is well underway. So I've said what I'm going to say about that, but uh, downturns lead to deficits. Uh, le deficits lead to debt. And debt very often leads to downgrades. Uh, which the risk factor going forward is one that we cannot dismiss. And this is not the gloom and doom scenario in which there's a massive sell-off of U.S. Treasury secured, nothing like that. But let us not forget that Japan, who is a, it's, it's a country that is a net lender to the rest of the world, faced more than one downgrade during the 1990s as the, the debt continued to pile, pile up after its major banking crisis that began in, in 1992. Of course, I won't mention the deadliest D because that's something that I'm concerned about for emerging markets, the deadliest D is default. But that's um, one that we, at this stage, are reserving for, for, for emerging markets. But let me turn to some of these Ds in, in what uh, little uh, time I have left. Um, I couldn't agree more uh, with what was said about the nature of the pileup in debt. And let me say that we may debate a lot about um, the fiscal stimulus, the size of the bailout. But let me be very clear that even absent a large-scale bailout, even absent a fiscal stimulus, deficits worsen dramatically during a financial crisis and debts pile up and that is for the simple reason that this is shown in if i'm too big to put glasses on but i think it's page six of your handout uh in which revenues government revenues suffer greatly and one of the things that chart highlights is that the downturn in revenues is is in line with the downturn in economic activity, long-lived. And government revenues come down importantly because obviously economic activity, both consumption and incomes, shrink, but also because property values are hard hit. Uh, so the, the, I cannot underscore enough that irrespective of what turn things take on the expenditure side, um, a baseline uh, in this kind of situation, and one is in which you do have um, um, worsening deficits and, and, a, and a stockpiling in government debt. Let me say also that the reversals, the great reversals in government, how do you bring that down? Well, if you're at the IMF, where I was many years, uh, you do debt sustainability scenarios that assume that you grow like Singapore, that interest rates remain at zero forever, and under and and every, and you become highly credible or even more so, and so that debts go down through growth. However, uh, Ken and I have done uh, considerable work in this area, and it is seldom the case that you simply grow your way out of debts. In the case of emerging markets, most of the big debt reductions, debt reductions to GDP, come about through restructuring of debt. In the advanced economies, they have come through protracted fiscal austerity uh, uh, programs. And I have to repeat myself, the, the, the use of the word protracted is one that I'd like to leave you with, because if I may be so bold as to make a prediction we are going to have more conferences like this because this problem is not one that is likely to be resolved. I, even, I think, under those that are buying the more optimistic V-shaped recovery, which is for the reasons I reiterated earlier, I am not, uh, the, uh, even with such a recovery, 
uh, we have already built up a lot uh, of the debt that needs to be addressed and also uh, bear in mind that when we broaden the definition of debt to include government guarantees, uh, we are swimming in an ocean of debt. So um, let me conclude here, since I've already overstepped my uh, boundaries, that uh, looking forward, I think, however, one danger that I would like to uh, leave uh, you pondering on, which is a lesson from the Great Depression, is yes, we have a debt problem going forward in terms of one that we have to um, more or less inevitably deal with at some point with some form of a fiscal austerity measures. Other advanced economies have done this. Emerging markets have also done this. But let us not be too premature on that. One of the great lessons from the Great Depression was that calling victory during the downturn, premature victory, is a real danger, and started worrying about the next problem when you haven't solved the present one, uh, is, is a serious issue. And that abrupt reversals in monetary and fiscal policy, which characterized the Great Depression, were a key factor in prolonging uh, that downturn. So let us be very cautious uh, before we declare this crisis uh, to be over. Thank you, Carmen. Uh, given the way you frame this as a global uh, crisis with, with unique uh, characteristics, I think we'll retitle your book, This Time is Different, It's Worse. <coughs> Thomas Pally. Sam, are, are there any uh, slides here? Thanks. Yeah. Well, uh, the, uh, good morning, everyone. Um, the organizers of the conference told me I had uh, six minutes, so given that, I wanted to make sure I got to eight, Tom. Well, oh, thank you, Steve. <laughs> I wanted, one moment more. I wanted to make sure that I got to my conclusion, and there it is. So uh, now, now uh, I have a chance to read my conclusion: uh, that how the budget deficit hysteria risks sabotaging growth and creating self-fulfilling budget difficulties. I guess I've got seven minutes left to persuade you that I'm right. So, uh, what we have right now is the US economy is still struggling to find a bottom to what uh, I think is all widely agreed, and I think I've just heard from Carmen, is the, great, uh, the deepest recession since the Great Depression of the 1930s. Now, this recession is clearly due to the massive failure within the private sector. Yet, what is interesting is many in the Washington policy establishment are already back to, an ar to arguing for fiscal austerity. So the claim here is that budget deficits are the number one problem because they threaten future financial stability. Now I want to argue that that's just a case of deja vu all over again. Because in a sense, fiscal the fiscal austerity agenda is a Washington perennial. Um, and I would also say that it, it, does, it especially tends to bloom with democratic administrations. That's, a, that's an aside. Um, now, I would argue that the fiscal austerity agenda was the wrong economic agenda before the crisis. And in, it's even more wrong in light of the economic weaknesses that the crisis has revealed. That's because it's based on fundamentally wrong-headed economic analysis. And later on, we're going to be uh, releasing a paper that I've written for New America that takes you through some of the arguments that fiscal conservatives make about why deficits are always damaging. And uh, I, I hope you'll get a chance to read that and be able to sort of balance the, the, the type of arguments that are out there. But I would also say further from my own standpoint that not only is it the wrong economic agenda, I also believe it's actually the wrong political agenda. And it's the wrong political agenda because it sort of revives an anti-government agenda that presents government as the problem at exactly the time that we need very considerable market reform. So bear that in mind as well. Now, why do we need uh, uh, um, uh, deficits? Well, the first reason, which has actually made a, a, a lot of progress over the last uh, year, I would say, 
is the old Keynesian reason. We need Keynesian stimulus to fight the recession. At a time of a shortfall of private sector demand, the government sector should step in and plug the shortfall to prevent a deeper recession. And I, I Carmen just mentioned, I think the great and immediate present danger of the fiscal austerity agenda is we could lead to a premature withdrawal of stimulus, causing a second dip to the recession. And history does indeed hold lessons here. In 1937, the Roosevelt administration succumbed to political pre pressure for deficit reduction, and the result was a second uh, recession within the Great Depression. Now, a second reason that we need stimulus, I think, is much less understood. And this is where I think I want to try and cover some, some new ground. As Shell has described, uh, the private sector is very heavily over-indebted, and it now needs to deleverage. Now, the result of that deleveraging, which we're already seeing in the economic data, is a massive increase in saving that far exceeds investment demand within the economy. Now, one of the features of a monetary economy is that every saver must find a taker. If they don't find a taker for that saving, then income will contract, that will increase unemployment, that will then in turn reduce saving, and that will extend the duration of this very painful deleveraging process. So that is where the role of go government has an important role to play. If government runs deficits, now we're talking about sustained deficits to facilitate this deleveraging process, then you can recycle the private sector saving, and that process of running deficits actually rebuilds the private sector's balance sheet by giving it financial assets in the form of government bonds in return. So this piece is very, very important about how government has a role in helping, the, in, in facilitating the deleveraging process and helping rebuild the private sector's balance sheet. Now, a second or, or a third reason, whoops, I think that's where I'll go back one. No, 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 I've really screwed up. A third reason uh, why we need um, government deficits, and here we're maybe even talking for more than the medium term. Maybe they should start to become, we're going to, I want to persuade you that they need to be a permanent part of our landscape. We need government deficits to spur economic growth. The old growth model that has sort of been in place for the last 30 years was based on debt and asset price inflation. And I think we'd all agree that that model is broken. And it raises a very big question. Uh, and again, Steve Cole referred to some, talking about some of the conferences you had last year, about what is going to be the source of growth now? Where will growth come from? And for that, we're going to need a new growth model. And I would argue that deficit-financed public investment can play an important role in this new growth model. We know from the economic literature that public investment has a high rate of return uh, and is desirable on those grounds. Now, after 30 years of low public investment, we therefore have both the need and the opportunity to step up the public, uh, public investment spending. And I would say that we can create a virtuous circle of growth or contribute to the creation of a virtu virtuous circle of growth, where deficit financed investment spurs growth, and that in turn creates fiscal space for other things. So a fiscal austerity agenda risks turning that virtuous circle into a vicious circle and reversing the pattern, whereby you cut deficits and you cut public investment, thereby lowering growth and therefore tightening the fiscal noose. Now that then leads to the question of what is a sustainable deficit? What sort of deficits can we think that we, we, we could run permanently? Well, I would say that with a, with a growth rate, and I've done some calculations in the paper, if you have a growth rate of 2.5% and a debt to GDP ratio of 100%, which by the way is a lot higher than where we're at now, the sustainable deficit is then 2.5% of GDP. The, def the debt will then rise at the same rate of growth, 2.5% of GDP. And with an interest rate of 2%, that implies an interest service burden of 4% of GDP. Now, deficits are not a free lunch, but that, on the other hand, is very supportable in terms of our economy.
Now, growth is very critical in this sort of sustainable deficit uh, and sustainable debt type calculation. That is because if you double the growth rate, you basically double the sustainable deficit. And that's where public investment kicks in. To the extent it can spur growth, it then makes our deficits more sustainable. Now, as things stand, our current debt to GDP ratio is only 50% or thereabouts. <coughs> and that means we could actually support, a, theoretically, and I think in terms of the numbers, we could support a doubling of that ratio and our fiscal position would still be sustainable. In other words, we have the room, if we want to, to use it to put in place this public investment uh, agenda that can help us escape this very difficult time. Now, if we theoretically have the room, it's also worth asking, what is the current budget outlook? Have we maybe in the future ex already exhausted that possibility? And again, I would say that we haven't, though there are adjustments to be made. Up on the screen here, you have a table that I've taken from the, uh, using data from the Center on Budget and uh, Policy Priorities, which is, a, a, I would say, a, a, quite a fiscally conservative uh, think tank in town. And, and they've uh, run projections of the 40-year budget outlook. And the top line says there that the, uh, the annual average deficit to GDP ratio looks to be, at the moment, negative uh, 4.2%. Now, on the surface, that is above the criteria that I've defined as sustainability. But if you begin to dig deeper, then you see that we can get back to sustainability, and more than that, austerity won't solve what problems we do have. The first thing is that if we let the, the, the Bush Cheney tax cuts of 2001 and 2003 expire in 2010, as they're currently legislated to do, we take off 1.9% of the uh, projected annual average deficit as a share of GDP. That alone gets us down to a projected annual average deficit of 2.3%, which is already in the ballpark of sustainability. Just that one measure. Then, if you also hold healthcare cost growth equal to per capita GDP growth, then you add back another 3% to our long-term budget uh, projected outlook. And we actually then, if you can accomplish that, uh, cost control, you actually then end up with a long-term projected surplus of seven-tenths of one percent. So what are the implications of this analysis? And I, I, this is not cooked numbers. This comes right out of this uh, the, the CBP's uh, uh, report on the long-term uh, budget projections. The budget, in my view, can be rendered sustainable through intelligent tax policy, letting some of the unnecessary uh, and bad tax policy of the past uh, expire. And then more fundamentally, we have a healthcare cost problem. That is what we should, how this whole discussion of budgets, public investment, fiscal policy needs to be financed. And the kicker is that the problem with our healthcare cost is not fixed by fiscal austerity. If fiscal austerity doesn't, is not the instrument that tackles the healthcare cost, that problem still remains on the books. And that means fiscal austerity could actually worsen the budget outlook. And in my book, that means fiscal austerity is in fact a form of economic malpractice. Tom, you just got done. Conclusion. Okay. So, I would say that, first of all, what we are seeing now is fiscal conservatives are opportunist opportunistically looking to exploit the recession to revive a pre-existing budget deficit crusade. That program is based on flawed economic analysis and is not supported by the numbers. In the short run, we need budget deficits to fight the recession. In the medium run, we need budget deficits to help with the private sector deleveraging. And in the long run, we should move to a program where we have public investment which can permanently spur growth, and that public investment can be financed by deficits that are permanently sustainable at a rough somewhere above or around 2% of GDP. Now, the fiscal austerity agenda will do triple damage, and this is my fear. The first, I think that 
I, what I heard from Carmen, <coughs> makes an extended period of economic stagnation and subpar growth more likely. Second, it makes the type of economic reforms we need more difficult by saying government is the source of the problem. And perhaps worst of all here is that it uses the budget deficit as a Trojan horse to get at other programs like Social Security, which people after the financial crisis of the last year and, and the wage stagnation of the past 25 years find more necessary than ever. Thank you. Thank you, John. Jamie Galbraith. Thanks very much. <clears throat> Nine days ago, in a now famous essay in the New York Times Sunday Magazine, Paul Krugman accused uh, the economics profession, his fellow economists, of mistaking beauty for truth. <laughs> I have some difficulty with this. He described the mathematical equations he was criticizing as gussied up, which is not, in my experience, normally a synonym for beauty. <laughs> but I think that um, a similar problem afflicts economic policy discussion in this community. And that is a mistaking of order for virtue. Balance is orderly. Imbalance is disorderly. Surpluses are virtuous. Deficits are disreputable. We need to get over this. We need to bear in mind that in the history of the Republic, we have only seen federal budget surpluses on about six occasions, and each one of them was followed by an economic downturn, by a recession or a depression. It's not accidental. And sometimes, as at the present, massive imbalance is exactly what you need. Ronald Reagan and George W. Bush, by the way, understood this very well, so I'm hardly making a partisan point at the moment. Uh, last night, Paul Solomon sent me a message asking for a contribution to his NewsHour blog uh, on the uh, most effective actions taken to stabilize the economy in the last year. And I replied that there were two. Uh, the first was, a, in the financial sector, the extension of deposit insurance and the nationalization of the commercial paper market, which quelled a panic that might otherwise have taken down the whole system a year ago. And the second was the ARRA, the stimulus bill, which although it could have been bigger and it could have been better, is now and will continue to contribute by absorbing resources that would otherwise uh, the unemployed in construction and helping to stabilize the budgets of states and localities, getting money into green jobs and essentially uh, some of the seed money that's going to be required for an expansion going forward. But the biggest thing, the biggest step that has kept us away from a Great Depression was not taken last year. It was taken by Franklin Roosevelt and by Lyndon Johnson in the 30s and the 1960s. That is to say, the creation in the New Deal of institutions like Social Security and the Great Society and institutions like Medicare. And the entire panoply of uh, federal government activity and the progressive income tax. Because these institutions gave us a public sector which is very much larger in relation to the economy uh, than it was in 1929, it was about 10% of the total. And as a result, when the private sector collapsed, the whole economy collapsed far less than it otherwise would have. The unemployment rate went up only to 10% and not to 25%. The deficit, uh, which now runs, what, 11 or 12% of the GDP, the public deficit, is in fact the reason, and the only substantial reason, that we have not in suffered a really massive Sheryl earlier described debt as a problem and the public debt as a smaller problem. But public debt is not a problem. Public debt is a solution, and at the moment, it's the only solution. I'm not saying it's an attractive solution. You might prefer another solution. But the choice is between that solution and no solution at all. This is a problem 
And many things that are said in economic policy discussion are highly ideological. But the basic accounting relationships are not. They're very straightforward, and they have to be agreed upon, I think, entirely across the political spectrum. And the basic point is that there is a reciprocal and symbiotic relationship between the public and the private sectors, where the private sector has a domestic and a foreign component. And when you understand that relationship, you understand things that are necessarily true. And I think it's fair to say that in a lot of policy discussion, including official policy discussion, these relationships are not adequately taken into account. Just yesterday, someone showed me the OMB forecast, the official forecast for the de deficit to GDP ratios going forward. It's now at a very high level by historical standards, above 10% of GDP, and then OMB expects it to come back to 5% of GDP next year, a very massive, very rapid reversal, maybe the next year or two. Uh, anyway, quite rapidly. The question then is, what does this imply? If one thinks, I suppose reasonably, that the foreign deficit, the current account deficit, will continue to be 5% of GDP, then implied in that necessarily is the assumption that the private sector, domestic sector, will be back to normal, will be finished deleveraging uh, next year, perhaps beginning as soon as three or four months from now. And if you think, by the way, that there might be a recovery of activity, which I do think is very likely, then the private sector is going to be uh, consuming imports, cars bought on the cash for clunkers program, for example, at a higher rate, and the current account deficit may be larger, the private sector is going to have to be going back into debt next year for that forecast to be reasonable. And I just wonder whether the official forecasters have thought this through. And if they haven't, we should recognize that, like it or not, we're going to face a much larger public deficit going forward. And the question for us is, do we do this the hard way, essentially running at its loss of tax revenues and unemployment, or do we do it the smart way by putting people to work and rebuilding the country with those unemployed resources? That's the choice we face. We don't have another choice. There will be a start to an economic recovery. We can see this in the data already. It's the end of the inventory liquidation plus the effect of the stimulus package plus the effect of the uh, automatic stabilizers. But you can see in the productivity numbers, which is another loaded term, it simply means that growth is resuming but employment is continuing to decline. That the population, the working population of the country is left behind and will be left behind in this process and will be increasingly unhappy as they hear all the good news coming from the statisticians and none of it affecting their lives. And after a short period, then we get to the question that Carmen raised earlier, which is, is this going to be sustained? Is it going to be carried forward in a way that will bring uh, a real change of direction and improvement in the living standards and employment prospects of the population. And there are very important reasons to be doubtful about that. And that is the problem of the private debt overhang. Public debts are sustainable. The public can always pay its bills in the money it creates itself. That's the simple reality of the world in which we live, but this is not true of private households or private businesses. They have to borrow against assets which have to have a value, and the asset values have crumbled. And I do not see any reason to believe that housing values are going to recover and permit a recovery of expansion, uh, an expansion of the basis of the growing private credit, such as we saw in the last decade. It seems to be very unlikely to happen anytime soon. There is the question of, this, of the condition of the credit institutions. With the repayment of the TARP, their capital requirements are effectively going up. Their regulatory standards will be tightened, and they will be more cautious anyway coming out of this crisis. So they're not going to be the engines of expansion that they were in the go-go period just past. We need to think, therefore, about the appropriate strategic direction for the economy going forward and the institutions and mechanisms that can make that direction effective. In 
my view, we have a huge amount. It's clear that we have a huge amount of work that we could be doing in this country, and we have the resources to do it with. We have a massive energy problem. We have to deal with the problem of climate change, which is a problem of production, and a problem of consumption, a problem of the way we live. We have been neglecting our infrastructure for a generation. This is the moment when we have the resources, if we have the will, to deal with these problems, and it is exactly the moment when they should be dealt with. The private sector will come in, and it will recover, uh, as it did in the information technology age and in the housing um, uh, boom, after the public sector sets and maintains a credible course. And that's the way things work, uh, you know, things have worked in the past, and we can expect if we create or recreate viable credit institutions in a suitably disciplined uh, and uh, adjusted to the need to act uh, in a spirit of public purpose, that the private sector can and will play a very important role going forward. But the job of the public sector is not over. And I should say also, just as a closing word, that before the private sector does come back into this picture, it will be necessary for the Federal Reserve to kick the banks out of the very comfortable nest which it has created for them um, by lowering their cost of funds to zero and giving them the opportunity to lend the money back to the government for a significantly higher return. It will do this as it did in 1994 by raising the cost of funds and forcing them to once again take the risk of lending to the private sector. But all of that is in the future, and it's going to still, we still have a massive task of that is primarily a public responsibility before we're going to have a sustainable pattern of economic expansion. Jamie, thank you very much, and thanks to all of you for, for insightful and thoughtful um, uh, presentation. Steve Call, when he opened the conference, talked about conventional and unconventional thinking. And if I just returned from Dalian, China, where I was participating in the World Economic Forum meeting there, and it's an interesting juxtaposition somewhat, some of the themes I heard there uh, versus some we've heard this morning. And for instance, in the North American Economy Panel, which I moderated, we voted, uh, the room voted on what it saw amongst a set of uh, various uh, issues would have globally uh, significant economic consequences, and they could choose between you know, the American healthcare debate executive compensation, I forgot what the others, but the federal budget deficit was one of those on there. And by 80%, that room of people said that growing a federal budget deficit would have globally seen. So I want to sort of use that as a foil for today's discussion because I think conventional wisdom, at least among those that run in the international finance community are there. And then secondly, and this is my question for the panel, Carmen Reinhardt really sketched out, I think, quite nicely the global dimensions of the crisis, but there's also a global uh, dimension to the debt challenge. And to some degree, Ameri I, I sometimes joke that America's power in the world today is the size of the Pentagon and the size of debt. The debt, debt is its own instrument to some degree. And our financier, China, uh, is scratching its head, and I wouldn't call uh, the Chinese uh, economic team perhaps the most experienced with uh, uh, our kind of rough and tumble economics. They're scratching their heads and saying, you know, we, are, we know we're caught in a trap, and if you think we're going to continue willingly going down this trap of financing your uh, mistakes, that's not gonna happen. And, and uh, Martin Wolf, Stephen Roach, and others uh, in this China forum very clearly said if China wants to continue, uh, if, if people think that there's a de facto statement that China will continue to throw good money after bad money, then you're mistaken. So I would throw this to you for those who are advocating a very large increase uh, in the public debt expenditures here, what, how do you account for how China is going to react to that? Because I can tell you it is palpable when you go over there that when you talk to policymakers uh, that are responsible for econo the economic side of this, they're doing everything they can privately to tell the United States, no, you cannot go down that route if you want us to continue to be an economic partner. So, Cheryl? Well, well first, Steve, I'd point out that Overall, U.S. borrowing from, from abroad has actually declined during this crisis and will continue to decline. Part, 
uh, obviously the current account deficit is now beginning to expand a, a little bit, but the overall total U.S. borrowing and issuance of debt has actually declined <laughs> because there's less private debt. And we don't need to worry about China? <laughs> Our savings rates are, are increasing. Uh, <clears throat> uh, if you took the poll, see, <clears throat> Uh, if you took the poll of those international financial participants, some of them could also be responding to that question because they actually know that budget deficits will actually be necessary for e U.S. growth in the, in, in the future. And given that the world is still dependent upon uh, U.S. demand to some degree, and it's also dependent upon the issuance of dollars to, to liquefy the world economy, <coughs> they're, they're <coughs> it, it's quite possible that some of those individuals in the international financial community actually could have been uh, voting for the internet, for uh, budget deficits of having the most impact globally because they see them as a benign factor, not as just a purely negative, although I don't dispute the fact that that, uh, that is negative. But I think Jamie and, and <clears throat> laid out very well the case going, going forward that in purely accounting terms, if the rest of the world wants to be able to enjoy some demand from the U.S. economy that benefits their economies, particularly China, then, then budget deficits are going to be necessary for an extended period of time. Accounting-wise, it doesn't work otherwise. <laughs> otherwise, China is going to be faced with a situation whereby they're going to lose more on their fixed investment than they're going to lose on their dollars. <coughs> China has made billions and billions of dollars of investment in export capacity over the last few years. It's adding to it now. If, it, if it's not able to find markets for that export capacity, there's going to be increased non-performing loans and they're going to have to mark down their profit margins and their returns on, on capital. That loss will be <coughs> that loss plus the loss of employment will be much greater than any loss on the dollar going forward. I think the smart, intelligent Chinese officials understand that. I think there's a certain amount of political posturing for nationalist purposes going on because they actually do understand that, and they have to square the circle. Any other responses before I open the floor, Jamie? The most wonderfully exaggerated title I ever held was the Chief Technical Advisor to the State Planning Commission of the People's Republic of China for Macroeconomic Reform uh, <laughs> in the middle 1990s. And I think Cheryl is basically uh, uh, dead on on this. The Chinese will be very, are very happy to receive uh, the tribute, the greatest since the Qing Dynasty of Secretary Geithner and Secretary Clinton coming to pay homage in the Forbidden City. Uh, and uh, to lecture us on the need for virtue and responsibility. This all gives them a great deal of pleasure. Uh, but uh, at the end of the day, they would much rather have the export business uh, than uh, to have uh, any particular financial advantage. And they're not about to use this very double-edged sword of the portfolio as a weapon uh, against the, the partnership or against the world economy. Uh, so I, I, I would say, well, I'd say also the other point being that Cheryl also made that as this uh, process goes forward, and as is happening now, the share of debt held uh, by U.S. nationals, by U.S. banks, is going to go up. The share of debt held by foreigners is going to go down. So the, the, this uh, the cosmetic problem uh, is going to look less important a year, two years from now than it does at present. Scott, I, I, yes, I, want, I want to cut in there a little bit, because I think this is a, a more nuanced and more complicated problem than is being acknowledged. I agree with both Charles and Jamie that the Chinese will not shoot themselves in the foot on this issue. They rely on, on, on our markets. They rely on exports. A sudden sell-off of the dollar will cause both huge portfolio losses to themselves uh, and, uh, and it will also damage the uh, global economy, which will hurt them. But there's another side to that. That means we have uh, a deficit, uh, deficits to fight the recession is not enough by itself. It has to be paired with other pieces of policy. And this is always hard to do in Washington. People sort of have one neuron means they can only handle one policy at a time. We've got to have at least two, two neurons here. We've got to stop this leakage in the global economy, which means global rebalancing. And that process has not even begun. 
I think the administration has been in denial about it. A lot of the fiscal spending will leak out of the economy. If any of you followed the Cash for Clunkers program, you will have seen the top five selling cars for orders of our imports. This is a huge problem. Thank you, Carmen. You wanted to jump in? Yes, well, I, I want to reiterate that one has to distinguish between the problem that is near at hand versus the problem that is far away. And I'm, I, I, I feel fairly strongly that, that it would be premature, uh, very premature, to start worrying about deficits when we're so unsure about we all agree we are having a recovery, but I think uh, Jamie's hit the uh, nail on the head in which the shape of which and how it affects employment remains on very shaky ground. So, so let me say that. However, Tom, on the other hand, I think sounds like the IMF in reverse. You know, we, we're going to have uh, the IMF calls for austerity in good times and for austerity in bad times and it just calls for austerity. And uh, I'm very concerned that uh, when you look past beyond the current conjuncture, which we need deficits, um, when you look beyond that, that it is very optimistic and very worrisome to me that, and this is your issue, that, that risk premium, will remain constant, that we will be blessed with nice, low, stable risk premium. After all, we were the nation was that was talking about the great moderation uh, a couple of years ago. We had tamed the business cycle, and look where we are right now. Would any of us have anticipated such a crisis in the United States? Therefore, can we really look into the medium term and say, we're going to have deficits and we're going to have debt all the time? Uh, and not worry about risk premium and about the rest of the world's willingness to hold it. And I, uh, I think those are two very separate issues, uh, the medium term and what faces us at hand on the fiscal front. Thank you. I think China uh, may have nowhere to go, but uh, it, is a, it is a debate in China this series. Let me open the floor. I'm going to ask people that, to identify themselves quickly, ask one of the three questions you have. We won't have time for more. Uh, make it brief, and we'll try to get very brief responses, not the entire panel uh, responding. But um, let me go right here, and then to Jed Schilling, and then to Ode. No, over here in the... Hi, I'm Dr. Caroline Poplin. My question is, didn't Japan try a big public investment strategy um, during their last decade, and for whatever reason, it didn't seem to work. Um, uh, comments on Japan's public investment strategy, and uh, it didn't seem to work. Um, I, I would privately contend with that, but but uh, 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 considering how bad, let me just put this: Larry Summers thought Japan was going to collapse. So, given that Japan didn't collapse, is Japan's lost decade the best that it was going to get anyway? But um, that's your question. Uh, responses. Uh, yeah, I think there's three three responses. One is the point that Steve made that it could have been a lot, lot worse. They hadn't done what they'd done. Second, they didn't take the other steps that were necessary. I mean, it goes to Tom's point that 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 you, in many cases, you do have to need a, a program of structural reform. Uh, three, they they actually killed off the momentum of the uh, recovery. Carmen's point uh, when they introduced and increased the consumption and value-added tax and destroyed, I think, what was beginning to be a, a, a sustainable uh, s sustainable recovery. Fourth, just add another fourth, the demographics in Japan are horrible in terms of, of, of for economic growth in, in any case, and so they may be in a situation where absent really serious structural changes, you know, the, the demographic conditions a lot more allow for the one to two percent growth that they've, they've enjoyed. Okay, quickly. I would just add to that that uh, we have done a marvelous job in the last year of emulating the Japanese non-restructuring of their financial system and cover-up of its asset problems, very differently from how the Swedes dealt with their financial crisis, which gave them a uh, functioning banking system back in a fairly short period of time. Jamie, can, can I just push you on that for a minute? Given what 
Almost everyone knows about the commercial real estate problem in the United States that continues to exist on bank books. I, I understand there's this term called pretend and extend. Pretend those values are what they are, extend the loans, and regulators today are complicit in the knowledge of that. I mean, is this not the next shoe to drop that in fact, and then it's a, it, it, it replays again the trust issue with government because government is uh, acknowledged and is complicit in, in essentially the continuation of, of, a, of a commercial real estate bubble. Is that a problem? The government can keep the banks operating in uh, functional insolvency, uh, disguised insolvency as long as it likes. Uh, that unfortunately does not give you a healthy attitude toward credit evaluation going forward. That's the problem. Mm -hmm. You're not resolving the difficulties and creating the basis for a good expansion. Uh, to take another Asian parallel, uh, I can't resist noting that the Chinese took enormous grief for decades for maintaining this massively insolvent banking system uh, full of non-performing loans. And what we seem to have done is to converge on the Chinese model, uh, but, but without the invigor I can't resist saying that in this, in this undisclosed location, with, without the invigorating leadership of the Chinese Communist Party to get things moving. Thank you. Steve, yes. you, you raised that. Again, I, I have to disagree very much on this zombie loan story. Uh, the regulators, in my view, this extend and pretend is exactly the right policy for now. You could not have a worse policy than suddenly dumping huge amounts of additional real estate onto the market. You would deflate, ca causing those who are currently solvent to become insolvent. You would uh, completely accelerate <coughs> a, a, a second downturn. No, none of the banks on, are not not lending for lack of liquid funds. Our system of fiat money run by the Federal Reserve enables them to put as much liquidity into the system as they want. The only thing the Federal Reserve decides is what is the cost they're going to charge banks. Right now that cost is effectively zero. What is stopping them from lending is a lack of confidence in borrowers and a lack of demand on the part of borrowers who don't see an expansion. So it is on the demand side that the problem is. The zombie loan problem is in fact purely a supply side story. It is a fiction. And in fact, at the end of the day, what it will do, because you will crystallize all the losses, and you will then call upon the federal government to bail people out, you will have a worse effect on the deficit, a worse effect on, on, on confidence, the possibility of the downgrading that Carmen has, uh, has talked about. For heaven's sake, let's get rid of this zombie loan story. Interesting, Judge Schilling. Yeah, I'm Jed Schilling from Millennium Institute, and I'm an economist, so I have a couple of things to say. Uh, one, briefly, I think it, though. Hmm? Briefly. Very briefly. One, I think in uh, looking at the overall debt picture, we should also include the public debt held by the government, since that includes Social Security and Medicaid and Medicare, and those are very large amounts of debts that have been paid for by forced public saving through the payroll tax. We need to account for that, because that'll be a major set of expenditures in the future. But my real question is, yes, I think that we need to continue massive imbalances in the government for a while to keep the economy under control. But I think in addressing this issue, I'd like to find, ask you, uh, particularly uh, James Gal Galbraith, about how we deal with reducing the massive imbalances of the financial sector, which goes beyond the commercial sector loans to derivatives and things like that, the restructuring of which has absorbed huge amounts of the government bailout program that has not contributed to the economy, but just restored and maintained financial sector profits. So we have to deal with their excessive imbalances in the future to prevent yet another ninth financial crisis <laughs> before long. So Jamie, uh, res remarks about um, the financial sector? Well, the administration has set a course of hope that uh, time will take care of the problems of the financial sector. And I think that's Tom's position is that that's the right course. Um, the alternative point of view is that time is unlikely to take care of these problems uh, and that they therefore have to be tackled, which is indeed very much a Gordian knot. Uh, and ultimately, I can tell you at the other end of the process, what you need to have is a financial sector which is smaller uh, which is back to where it was as a share of the economy, let's say 15 or 20 years ago, not paying 40% of profits or 10% of wages, uh, which is composed of more numerous and smaller institutions, 
uh, so that you don't have institutions which are uh, too big to fail, too big to manage, too big to regulate, uh, and which are intrinsically, systemically dangerous, uh, and in where the public utility functions are handled in a appropriately <coughs> a public way, uh, or a way which fits public purpose, basic functions of the payment system. Uh, getting there uh, is a, a challenge which uh, I cannot give you a short answer to the, uh, the how it could be achieved. It's a very, very difficult problem. Well, we need to get there. That, Jed, sorry. Odie Aberdeen. Odie Aberdeen, Capital Trust. Uh, Carmen, Professor Kindleberger used to say when you have an asset bubble or when you have a bubble, it takes seven years to really cure that bubble. We seem to be in a hurry that you know it's been going on for two years. Historically speaking, it has taken a long time. This time around, though, we had really three bubbles. We had a housing bubble, we had a debt bubble, and we had a commodities bubble. Reaction. Well, uh, the crisis has been going on for two years, but housing did peak at the end of 1995. So it's been going longer, but you're absolutely right. And Kindleberger was right. One of the things we highlight is that uh, if you look at the post-war, all right, only uh, peak to trough real estate price declines average uh, six years. Uh, and that post-war, pre-war, they tended to be somewhat longer. But getting back to your, your point about a triple one, um, they go hand in hand. That wasn't new to this one. If you look at other crises, the, the credit frenzy we have here, uh, which is what we inherited now, um, takes a while to unwind this was very much in the spirit uh, of your remarks, and uh, it and it has to unwind both at the household level and at bank level, and that is going back to the issue of, of a premature victory. I think I cannot stress uh, enough that people think of this recession. Uh, as already the longest one on record post-war and say, aha, it's got to be over, it's got to be V-shaped because it was so deep, and, and, and I'm very concerned about that. Okay, thank you. Right here. And uh, we'll take this as the last question for this panel and before we move to the next one. Yes. Kathleen Connell, Berkeley. Um, I want to follow up on the panel's view that the deficit is going to be protracted, or the need for the deficit is protracted. How do we stimulate jobs? Um, I don't hear any uh, suggestions from the panel on that, and that clearly needs to be the, the extension of That's the That's the uh, next money. month conference. But <laughs> well, I'd like to get the opinions. Right. I'd like to get the opinions of all four of them. Great. Conference, uh, reaction on how we stimulate jobs, Jamie? I, I think there, there are two major areas. One is the construction of the country, uh, which is a major enterprise, and dealing with the energy and uh, climate change challenges uh, could if done properly, employ a great many people for many years. Uh, and then uh, secondly, uh, one can employ a great many people uh, in the basic uh, business of taking care of each other. Uh, we have a vast need for people to uh, take care of them. We have an older population that people need to be available to take care of them. We have and could expand uh, uh, and improve our education system. That's very labor intensive work. Uh, so I have no problem with imagining areas in which we can find useful work that people are qualified to do that would prevent a generation of unemployment and pure waste of human potential. The issue here is finding the institutional structures under which the, those people can be brought into employment and persuading ourselves that it's the right thing to do. It doesn't use a lot of resources that wouldn't otherwise be used in supporting people on the dole, but it does generate wealth that and prosperity and the sense of well-being that we're otherwise completely foregoing. Thank you, Jamie. Tom. Uh, well, th three things. Um, the first is I've already talked about it: uh, public investment, the type of things that uh, Jamie's been talking about. Um, the second thing is rebalancing the global economy, bringing investment, manufacturing investment, back to the U.S. and very importantly, redirecting our patterns of expenditure, changing the composition of our expenditure away from imports back to domestically produced uh, goods. That, of course, brings in the exchange rate question and the China question we've already alluded to. And then along with that, you also need a labor market policy that begins the process of income redistribution back to workers 
And most importantly, which is missing in all this discussion, is how do we recreate that historic bond between productivity growth and wage growth that was ruptured. And when that was ruptured, that's what pushed us onto this path of growth by debt and asset price inflation. I do one last point. Uh, Carmen made uh, comments about my views about long run uh, deficits. Uh, the history, I use Jamie's word, the history of the Republic is a history of deficits. And deficits have been associated with growth. The question is how large they should be. In my view, we're talking about a 2% deficit sustainable over a long time. That is what, and, and what, I'm, what we need to do is move the conversation away from a fixation with balance or even budget surpluses. Those are bad. Deficits are not a free lunch. You push them out to 4%, they can either eat away at your tax revenue or you'll finance them with money and cause major inflation. So it's finding that middle road that our conversation about fiscal policy has not managed to find over the last 20 years. Thanks, Carmen. Carmen? Uh, that's a loaded question. Uh, so, but, but I will hark back to the gentleman's uh, point earlier. Um, one of the most employment intensive sectors is under siege. A construction activity is very uh, labor intensive and we're just not likely to see a resumption uh, of the trends we saw uh, in the run up to the crisis for a while. Um, and I would say that I'm also very concerned uh, that in uh, the emphasis on trying to gain jobs that we fall into some of the same uh, rhetoric and the same problems we fell into the depression and that has to do with trade. Um, trade doesn't go, trade actions don't go unpunished and if we learned something from the Great Depression and the implosion of trade that we had there was that uh, everybody trying to bring jobs back home at the same time just doesn't work globally. Uh, so, so, you know, I would have to say that, that in the context of a stimulus package, you do what you can, but your expectations should be tamed uh, by the cycle that we're in. Sure. Uh, yeah, I, I just wanted to underscore what, the, uh, what I think is one of the most important implications of what Tom in particular was saying, because <clears throat> in, in some ways it's a mistake to focus so much on the deficit question per se, because this is really also a question of rebalancing and restructuring the U.S. economy, I think in a healthy way, because in essence what you're doing is you're shifting the economy from private consumption, an excess of what has been an excess or unsupportable or unsustainable uh, private consumption, which is creates jobs in shopping malls, etc., uh, to uh, to investment uh, that has been lacking in in essential um, infrastructure and quality of life um, investments in in the public sector. So, in, in some ways, <clears throat> I think we can get caught up too much with the sustainability of the deficits per se when we're not under, understanding that the implication actually is a healthy implication of shifting from excess private consumption to much needed public infrastructure and public investment, which will have healthy implications both for jobs and incomes and wages in the future. So <clears throat> I, I think we need a more sophisticated way to talk about debt and deficits. Most of the debt of the past two decades was, was uh, financing uh, consumption or excess uh, housing construction more recently or, or speculation. What is being proposed going forward is, is debt that, that actually lays the foundation for the next stage of economic growth and, and incomes and wage increases. And that's a big distinction I think we have to understand. Thank you very much for this very rich discussion. I think that you know, looking at the questions and the balance between public debt and private debt and trying to give people more tools with which to sort of think through these economic questions are very important. Please join me in thanking Cheryl Schweninger, Carmen Reinhardt, Thomas Crowley, and Jamie Galbraith.